Most stable organic compounds have an even number of electrons. This means that the vast majority of radical reactions begin with the cleavage of a two-electron bond to form two radicals. This is called homolytic bond cleavage, and the propensity of a particular bond to undergo homolytic bond cleavage is related to its bond dissociation energy. We'll see that radical initiators, compounds that initiate or begin radical reactions, have low bond dissociation energies. This means that they have bonds that can break easily with an investment of energy to form two radicals. Let's begin by looking at homolytic bond cleavage from a curved arrow perspective. So if we take a general compound that has a bond in it, XY, the homolytic cleavage of this bond is just the breakage of the bond giving one electron each to each of the atoms involved. This forms two radicals, X dot and Y dot. Contrast this with the more common and more typical heterolytic bond cleavage, which gives both electrons in the bond to the more electronegative heteroatom typically involved. A lone pair results on X here, and a cation results on Y. The ability of a particular bond to break homolytically depends on its bond dissociation energy, and you see a table of bond dissociation energies on this slide. These energies are averages, and so you may see the numbers vary somewhat, but these are nice benchmarks that we can use. What exactly is this value indicating? Well, if we think of the bond cleavage as a reaction in and of itself, we can imagine the starting materials, say we're imagining a CH bond, and the products, which are the separated carbon and hydrogen radicals. The delta H for this process is indicative of the bond dissociation energy. So for example, we see from the table that the CH bond dissociation energy is about 100 kcals per mole. This means that to break the carbon-hydrogen bond homolytically, we require an investment of 100 kilocalories per mole of energy. This state where the carbon and hydrogen radicals exist is 100 kilocalories per mole higher in energy in a thermodynamic sense than the starting material. Within the table, we can recognize some important values. These are the low values. Low bond dissociation energies indicate that the diradical product is not terribly unstable with respect to the starting materials. This means that it might not take a terribly large investment of energy to break these particular bonds. So for example, the OO bond has a bond dissociation energy of only 33 kilocalories per mole, and we find that compounds that have the form ROOR are very common radical initiators and have the ability to break at the OO bond. Bond dissociation energies of the halogens also tend to be very low. For example, the bond dissociation energy of ICL and IBR are both quite low, and the bond dissociation energies for the elemental halogens, which aren't shown on this slide, are likewise very low. Two more examples that I'll point you to. The silicon-silicon bond is pretty low at only 45 kilocalories per mole. And you should notice that the carbon iodine and the carbon silicon, as well as the carbon bromine bond energies, are particularly low. I point these out specifically because we'll see in later examples of radical reactions that there are bonds within organic compounds that are more liable to break to form radicals. And so when we're thinking about predicting the products of radical reactions, we have to look for these bonds that are liable to break homolytically. Let me show you another example of a reaction where a bond breaks homolytically that you might not at first think is related to this process of just bond cleavage on its own. So imagine we had a species, say, that was the result of a radical initiator breaking homolytically, and we'll just call that R dot, and imagine we had a compound R3CH that was involved in a radical reaction. The tendency of this R dot to remove hydrogen and form, say, R3C radical and RH is related to the bond dissociation energy of that CH bond. Think to yourself that if this R abstracted a hydrogen from anywhere else in R3CH, we would still form RH, but we would form a different carbon radical. And so the selectivity of R to remove this hydrogen depends on the bond dissociation energy of that particular bond. What we find is that weak bonds in the starting materials of radical reactions tend to be targeted specifically. 
And these end up being things like carbon bromine, carbon iodine, and carbon silicon, as well as carbon sulfur bonds. These are all very weak bonds that end up being targets for the products of radical initiation, which are themselves radicals. And we can point to the bond dissociation energy as a quantitative measure of the likelihood of these bonds breaking. So let's take a survey now of some of the common radical initiators to see how they work. So I've already mentioned the peroxides. These are compounds of the form ROOR, and really the key functionality in these is the weak OO bond with that low bond dissociation energy. These can break homolytically to form two OR radicals, which then go on to abstract an atom or do further radical chemistry to promote radical reactions. The elemental halogens are another important source of radicals, and although these bond dissociation energies are a little bit higher, what we find is that with an investment of energy, usually in the form of either light, ultraviolet light, or heat, which you see represented as the delta symbol, these will form two radicals via homolytic cleavage also. Now the last radical initiator I'll discuss is azo bis isobutyronitrile or AIBN, and this is an important one because it's an all-organic compound, and at first glance it doesn't appear to have a weak bond that can easily break homolytically. So as I draw this structure, look for the potential to form radicals in this. It's a little bit tricky to see because there really isn't a particularly weak bond within this structure. So you can see that it's got some methyl groups and it's got a couple of doubly bound nitrogens and two nitrile groups. None of these bonds look particularly weak and making recourse to a bond dissociation energy table would confirm that. But the trick with AIBN is that it has the ability to form radicals with the irreversible loss of a gas. So buried within this structure is this N2 linkage. And if we could form just a third bond between those nitrogens, we would have nitrogen gas, which would simply bubble out of the solution and irreversibly form radicals. And that's essentially what happens. So simplifying the situation a little bit, we can see that if both of the CN single bonds broke homolytically, we could form a triple bond between the nitrogens and separate the two butyronitrile fragments from the central nitrogen atoms so that we would form N2, which is a gas that would just float away, bubble out of the solution, and two equivalents of this butyronitrile radical, which is a nice radical that's stabilized by resonance and goes on to do additional chemistry as well.